Hello, everyone, and welcome to our May webinar. Uh, hope it's sunny where you are, and we are so happy to have you join us today for another European Speciality Association webinar to learn, connect, and inspire tea professionals everywhere. I'm Bernadine Tay, one of the founding directors of ESTA, along with my fellow directors, Alexis Kay and David Veal. And as an association, we are champions of speciality tea, and we have today a topic that you don't want to miss. Now, if you're a tea supplier and you want to know why selling teas, selling local teas will earn you the highest profits, stay tuned as we have chief editor of the Tea Journey magazine, Dan Bolton, discussing why tea's chaotic, fragmented market is a matter of taste. This is going to be interesting. Now, I'd love to give you the chance to ask Dan, as usual, any questions, and you can do this during the webinar anytime by posting them in the Q&A box during the session. And we'll do our best to address your questions at the end of the session. So for the next 35 to 40 minutes, maybe a little more, sit back, relax, and sip some tea. Welcome, Dan. We're so pleased to have you with us today for the second time in our webinar series. So, so happy. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, before you start, can I just ask you a question as we ask all our guests here uh, on our webinar series? What does speciality tea mean to you and how would you define it? You know, I'm, I, I've now kind of come to a poetic sort of description of this in which I say that it's an expression of the tea maker's art. So in other words, in the same way that a grape is transformed into a beautiful wine, the leaf is transformed into a beautiful tea. And so the definition, I think, is independent of whether it's format or a green tea or black tea. But what instead it is, is in my view, it's that alchemy. It's the natural alchemy of someone who takes terroir and varietals, and cultivars, uh, characteristics, and then applies the craft of, uh, you know, tea making, the rolling and the withering and such. So uh, that's long winded. I have a short version for you as well, but <laughs> it's, an ex it's an expression of the tea maker's art, in my view. Uh, which which helps us clear away what, uh, whether it's orthodox or whether it's CTC or it, 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 I'm not so much worried about that as just I am. Did the tea maker create a work of art here? And and if it's a work of art, it'll be distinctive. If it's distinctive, then it meets my definition of specialty too. Very very well said. But I expect nothing less from you. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Um, right, without further ado, because I know you have some beautiful stories to share, we'll let you take the floor, and when you're done, we'll ad address your questions, uh, the questions from the crowd to you, okay? Oh, thanks so much. Have fun, everybody. So, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dan Bolton, and I'm... Uh, so pleased that you took the time today to spend some time with me in this conversation. Um, I've traveled to many, many tea lands, and in all of those times, I've tried to both experience the uh, the, the, the beauty of, of not just the tea uh, plantations and the tea farms, but to, uh, but to take tea with people and to, and to sit with them and eat the food that they eat with their tea and to understand how they uh, have incorporated tea into their culture. Um, I love this picture. This is Kazakhstan. And you'll notice that everyone drinks tea from a bowl, not from a cup. And it's a communal tea. They, they pass the tea and everybody pours a cup and the uh, foods are all spread out in front of them. And that's an underlying theme of today's uh, conversation. There's a remarkable thing that's happened over the centuries, and that's that tea has sort of become uh, inextricably uh, tied to the, the culture and the method of preparation and the tools like the samovar and the, the kettles and such, as well as things like ingredients like Moroccan mint and uh, you know uh, various characteristics, uh, bergamot, uh, that make tea 
uh, distinctive to an area and ultimately make tea, in, in my view, an expression of culture that's actually uh, more uh, profitable and more likely to succeed in the future uh, because of a single fact, and that's that the distribution now enables you to get local tea anywhere you happen to be. So with that, hello everyone. National and regional tea brands are thriving, I'm happy to say. Multinationals, not so much. And here's why. Billion dollar brands prosper by marketing blends globally. Companies including Unilever, Tata, Associated British Foods set the pace in mechanization, supply chain efficiency, sustainable processing, third party certification, transparency, all these things are very important. But despite the efficiencies of scale and marketing, and 150 years of competing with smaller brands in regional markets, the small brands still control 90% of the global market. And this is because people are picky about their tea, not just how it tastes, but how it's prepared, garnished, sweetened, and shared. Teas tailored to cultural preferences consistently earn the greatest praise and profits. And there's a resurgence of national and uh, you know, regional brands, thanks to uh, remarkable progress in cultivation and e-commerce, distribution, packaging, and merchandising, all resulting in a distinctive taste that consumers have remained loyal to for decades. Note that in this talk, I'm focusing on hot tea, the marketing dynamics uh, of the ready to drink uh, tea segment are substantially quite different. So uh, in Kazakhstan, we're drinking a, a black tea and uh, it's called Sha and uh, Shai. And uh, the tea is uh, often accompanied by food. And as you see, it's traditional, it's a teapot tea bowls instead of cups. And uh, it's uh, very traditional at, at, uh, at formal meals and such. As we go to India, we of course know about masala chai, but we also see a uh, kawa. And kawa is an almond, uh, uh, green tea. It's a green tea flavored with almonds, and it's often used in ceremonial events. It's just a lovely tea. And here we go to Turkey. In Turkey, uh, more people drink tea in Turkey. Uh, the per capita is about four kilos per year, <laughs> about eight times more than tea drinkers in most European countries. Uh, and in their particular case, they brew the tea uh, using a, uh, a decoction method. They, they create a very rich, strong, uh, concentrated tea in the top teapot. And then in the lower teapot, they boil water. So what you do is you take your tea from the top teapot, pour it in your cup, and then you make the decision about how much you want to dilute it. And you create a, uh, you know, in this case, they have orange peels. You create a treat by adding sugar and uh, other garnishments. This is a samovar. Uh, my, my wife, I'm so delighted to say this was my birthday week and uh, she bought a samovar for me, which is something I've been kind of coveting for a long time. And uh, what it does is the same technique. Uh, you're heating the water in this case inside of an ornate boiler and then you're uh, brewing the tea in a, uh, a, uh, uh, a, 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 a teapot at the top. Notice uh, here that uh, uh, the jam in the background, uh, the Russians favor their tea with uh, uh, jam. So many times uh, it's sweetened that way. So now I'll take you to Morocco for a second. And uh, I wanna use Morocco as an example of it. It's, it's a very interesting market right now. Uh, first of all, it's the largest market for uh, Chinese green tea in the whole world. Uh, Moroccans drink about 77, 1,600 metric tons uh, of, of tea, uh, green tea from China, uh, uh, far more than the 25,000 metric tons imported by the United States and Canada combined. And um, one of the things that's interesting about this particular market is, is that because it's so strong, the Chinese have actually built factories 
in uh, tea factories in uh, Morocco. And they're making tea, they're packaging tea there and uh, created a brand, which is uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute called uh, Le Mans Yoto. And uh, that brand uh, did a hundred metric tons of tea last year, sold a hundred metric tons of tea in five uh, Western and uh, Northern uh, African uh, countries. Now here the tea is, is sweetened and uh, it's called shape and uh, McRib is the, is the uh, mint. And uh, in this particular case, the tea has uh, a wonderful uh, uh, sweetness to it. It's energizing, it's brewed strong, uh, it gives you a good uh, caffeine uh, uh, jolt. And uh, these are countries uh, that are less interested in coffee and more in tea. A visit quick to Pakistan. These young folks are enjoying tea in uh, a traditional British style. You see the little brown Betty there. And uh, you also see in uh, these, this part of the world uh, in, in Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, uh, you see uh, chai. Uh, this is spiced tea, and uh, it's heavy on the ingredients. The tea is often a strong, bold uh, Assam tea, and it's it's built with this idea that uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's again it's a decoction. It's boiled on the stove in the home, and uh, it's uh, satisfying. It's uh, ever uh, every place so you can buy it on the street corner. You can buy it on the train station. They walk down the aisles of the train cars and sell it to you from big, big pots of, uh, of chai. And it's built so that uh, it satisfies you. It's an interesting, it satiates you very quickly. It's also got the energy uh, uh, and it's uh, often uh, sweetened as well. I love this picture because uh, this, is a, this is a tent <laughs> and uh, the tea was uh, uh, heated on a fire outside the tent uh, and poured. And uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, surprisingly, is one of the stronger uh, black tea. This is a, the strongest, fastest growing black tea market in the world right now. So uh, the brands that serve uh, Saudi Arabia are uh, cognizant of, of how the tea is prepared. And uh, they're uh, providing uh, teas that are satisfying both to the culture and to the taste. So you'll see me uh, note key takeaways every so often. And uh, this one is uh, simply a restatement of, of my little introduction here. Uh, it teas a, a, a diverse tea culture is, is sort of simultaneously its greatest strength and its most formidable obstacle. How did the global tea brands get their start? Consolidation of uh, the tea industry, uh, which, which had been widely uh, fragmented in the early days, uh, began with sovereign trade monopolies. The, the British East India Company in the 1600s, the Dutch East India Company founded in 1602, established trade routes protected by formidable navies. And during the 1700s, England mandated that all tea first be delivered to uh, London where it was auctioned, taxed, and then shipped to the colonies. So I found this e extraordinary uh, a cartogram. This is a depiction of the uh, amount of tea uh, consumed uh, by a particular uh, country. So you see in those days that uh, the England and China, although in this case, China consumed twice as much as England, uh, are the big dominant uh, consumers. All the other countries, uh, the United States, Canada, all the countries in red on this map are part of the British empire. Um, all the other countries are relatively uh, small uh, consumers of tea. And uh, that's uh, because of a series of wars and, uh, you know, efforts on the part of the British Empire to uh, bring together uh, all of the supply chains. So uh, co uh, consolidation peaked just before World War II as India, Ceylon, and the Dutch East Indies companies, which are, uh, represent Java and Sumatra, established a cartel 
to reverse the steep decline in tea prices during the Great Depression. In 1927, tea, tea prices just tanked. And then uh, Nyasaland, the Kenya, Uganda, Tanganyika, Malay, all voluntarily agreed to limit tea acreage, but not tea production. The collusive document signed in 1930 was explicit and voluntary. It didn't have legal sanctions to enforce the agreed restrictions on expansion. But what it did was it limited cultivation to 2 million acres and production at 800 million pounds. It's about 365 million kilos. So it was a very successful maneuver. Prices immediately increased about 30% on average. And the share value, which was the critical concern, the share value of the tea companies rose 90% in little more than six months. So this meant that the base companies, you know, the predecessors of uh, the multinationals that we see today, uh, just before the war had a strong, uh, you know, boost in the sense that uh, their stocks uh, value rose, the companies generated good revenue in the middle of, of the depression. And then immediately afterwards, uh, the British uh, government, uh, as war was declared, uh, bought all of the tea in bulk for the whole empire. So what then happened is, is all of this tea is concentrated. These big companies are all uh, in, in places like India and, and, uh, uh, and England are all concentrated and they have a finite uh, resource because the amount of tea is limited. And they also have this uh, remarkable, uh, you know, reason to all be a uh, 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 rather than competitive, they all have this reason to be collectively supportive of the uh, effort. So uh, that meant that they made money, uh, significant amounts of money. Uh, England's $200 million earnings in 1934 is the equivalent of $4.2 billion in today's uh, dollars. And it was a lasting uh, benefit to the industry because uh, uh, innovations and uh, you know uh, supply chain refinements all occurred in a, a period in which uh, you know prior to this most most tea had been harvested, processed locally, brought to a market. <clears throat> this was before the introduction of tea bags, before they became widespread. And so uh, packaged tea uh, suddenly became the thing. And uh, at that time, uh, there was a, a point of view that emerged, which is that um, we can decide uh, for you, meaning we're the tea suppliers and blenders, we can decide for you uh, and then produce a consistently uh, a identical tea uh, day in and day out uh, because of our skilled blenders and market it globally. And uh, it took off. Uh, these brands like uh, Tetley and Twinings and uh, Lipton uh, all uh, generated uh, lots of money for the longest period of time. And uh, because the relationships were pretty consolidated, the auction in London was dominant, uh, pricing was relatively stable. And, uh, you know, after the cartel was dissolved, then, uh, you know, widespread planning occurred. But the point is, is that there was this, this moment in time when uh, everybody in the uh, everybody in the industry was, uh, you know, sort of working together on the same uh, the same team. So uh, what happened uh, that's, uh, I think, most significant uh, uh, development in uh, in tea is uh, distribution. Uh, it, it used to be that a supermarket could control distribution or that uh, you know, a conglomerate uh, with brands uh, dictated how the, how the tea would be distributed. Uh, local supermarket chains created their own brands. And uh, you know, there was a sense that uh, you had to jump over a hurdle. You had to be a distributor. You had to get to a distributor and partner with a distributor or you have to develop a relationship with uh, like a supermarket so that they'd buy in large quantity. Um, and, and what happened uh, is, is that that began to unravel. Um, we, we now have a situation in which uh, uh, we've got a remarkable amount of tea uh, circulating. There's 7.8 billion people on earth. 
and tea consumption in uh, 2022 is estimated about 6.8 billion kilos, with China alone consuming 2.8 billion. And uh, tea drinkers today drink about 8.2 billion cups a day. That's far more than was conceived in, uh, you know, 1934. And uh, yet the experience of drinking tea remains much as it was in the powdered tea mocha days of the Tang Dynasty in uh, the 16, in the 600s. And uh, the steep tea praised by poets uh, during the Song Dynasty that ended during the 1200s. In the past 1500 years, the most significant change in global, uh, the most significant change in tea is global distribution, which affords anyone anywhere on earth access to the tea lands, including direct delivery from single estates. So you see the old supply chain uh, had several uh, different, um, you know, uh, components to it. And uh, now we see um, now we see the supply chain producing uh, a, a, what they call DTC, it's direct to consumer uh, shortcuts. So uh, beginning in the 1950s, the popularity of tea bags propelled vertically integrated monolithic uh, ventures seeking to establish a one size fits all global brand and the widespread adoption of CTC processing power uh, actually propelled uh, Lipton uh, Yellow Label to the enviable position as the best known and biggest selling branded tea with sales uh, exceeding uh, 3 billion uh, euros a year. It's like 3.6 billion US dollars. The Lipton that was founded 150 years ago in Glasgow, Scotland uh, is now available in 110 countries. But tellingly, not in the UK, where regional brands like Yorkshire and Berries and PG Tips uh, prevail. It's apparent that while lucrative and widely available, Lipton Twinings and Tetley Tata Tea have failed to convince tea drinkers that uniformity, consistency, and convenience eclipse local tea culture. So here's a business insight. How we shop for tea has changed significantly. E-commerce accelerated during the pandemic, driving record sales of packaged and of packaged foods and it encouraged at-home consumption and distribution expanded. There's a, a lot of conversation about how uh, jammed uh, logistics uh, are right now. But the truth is, uh, things like distribution of the pandemic uh, uh, vaccines, you know, created air corridors between different countries, lots of innovative uh, things, including a substantial amount of cold storage, <coughs> which makes it uh, very practical for regional brands to sell direct to consumers, utilizing last mile delivery which is managed by efficient service providers. So your Amazons and such like that, the DHL, Amazon combination, the DHL, UPS, FedEx, the proven plant-based life enhancing benefits of tea took on a new urgency in, an, in a world fearful of contagion and premiumization at the same time increased sales value in developing countries so in producing countries, tastes are changing at the village level as rural populations that favor unbranded tea decline. Unilever's decision last year to sell the 34 brands that make up Ekaterra tea is a deal that will soon close. And it signals a seismic shift in tea retail, writes Euro Monitor beverage analyst Matthew Barry. The sale, quote, will further accelerate the key long term trend in the competitive landscape of global tea fragmentation. In the future, the key players in tea will be regional or national, and there will be little direct competition between them. I think Matthew's dead on here in his prediction. To foresee the future, pay attention in the next few weeks 
as to whether Ecoterra offloads the regional black tea brands like Michelle's in Australia, or invests in a regional brand strategy that will signal that the tide has turned for multi-billion dollar global black tea blends. So what replaces them or what simply fills the vacuum? And the answer is authentic brands. The global tea market will generate an estimated 230 billion in sales this year, a total expected to reach 267 billion by 2025. Five companies and their associated billion dollar brands dominate the package segment but combined, the sales of the largest companies amount to only 9.5% of the global market. Ecoterra Tea, with its Lipton, PG Tips, and Tazos, now the largest brand by volume and value. Tata Global Beverages is next, Associated British Foods with Twinings. Then Unilever, which retained many of its uh, Indian holdings and so, uh, some of those in uh, Asia with the Taj Mahal brand. Uh, Nestle with its Nest Tea, and in Japan, Itoin, which is uh, both an RTD and dry tea supplier, all report annual turnover greater than a billion dollars. So this is an interesting uh, photo of one of my friends in Moscow took this picture. It's the tea aisle at a suburban Moscow supermarket in February 2022. And it offers a selection typical of developed countries. There are more than 50 teas on six tiers of shelves. Regional, national, and multinational brands are on display, many with line extensions at various price points. British brands include Twinings and Lipton Yellow Label. Regional brands, Ahmad Tea, Curtis Tea, are all manufactured in the UK. Sri Lanka brands like Dilma and Akbar which in 2012 introduced Burnley Tea in Russia, and several other Russian brands uh, marked the shelves. Notice that the top shelf displays premium teas by Moscow-based May Foods, Maisky Tea in Russian, and Orimi Trade, the Russian Federation's leading tea supplier with brands uh, Tess and Greenfield, as well as uh, Princess uh, Gita, Princess Candy, and Princess Nori. Assad is a premium private label that you see on the shelf, owned by Russia's largest food retailer. Notice that the principal brand message is authentic. So here's a close look at, at one of the brands. Uh, Orimi Trade is uh, a market leader in Russia. It has about 30% share of the hot beverage market. Its uh, production volume was 85,000 metric tons, which makes it one of the world's largest. But the distribution of this particular tea is, is really uh, quite limited. It's uh, certainly widespread in, in Russia and adjacent uh, CIS countries. But uh, you know what's changing is, is that it's beginning to uh, be exported. So uh, Arimi is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. It's a tea that has real roots. It's a tea that's uh, very well known in its uh, uh, native lands. It's a uh, market leader in uh, Belarus, Moldova, uh, and, and Russia, and uh, it's got multiple brands. It's one of the 400 largest Russian companies and among the 200 largest privately held companies. It's founded in 1994, so it's a new brand, uh, relatively speaking, in, uh, in, and in St. Petersburg, uh, where it brings in uh, you know, several thousand tons uh, of tea uh, a month. And here's its competitor. Uh, this is Maisky Chai, May Tea. Uh, it's second in the Russian market with about a 20 plus share and the best known brand according to consumer surveys due to its marketing uh, competency. It's a division of May Foods, one of the largest food companies in Russia. And uh, what these guys do is uh, import hand-picked teas uh, uh, at plantations in India, Sri Lanka. Uh, Russia is an orthodox tea drinking country. So <clears throat> what you see there is teas from Sri Lanka, for example, is the biggest supplier. Uh, or orthodox teas grown in uh, 
in India and also in um, Kenya, and then a sizable amount of Assam tea. Uh, Maisky imports about 20,000 metric tons of Orthodox tea annually. So before we delve, delve deeper into why regional brands are thriving, let, let's take a minute to, uh, to review the big picture. The most populous countries drink tea. The wealthiest countries drink coffee. Caffeinated hot drinks are immensely popular. Tea and hot coffee consumption has rapidly grown for decades. In 2012, global consumption was 4.9 billion kilos. A decade later, consumption increased to 6.9 billion kilos and is estimated to reach 7.4 billion kilos in 2025, according to Statista. Consumption varies widely in Europe. The Irish lead drinking more than three kilos per person. 84% of the British population drinks tea or herbal infusions. Tea, uh, they uh, together, they consume about 100 million cups daily compared to the 70 million cups of coffee uh, consumed there, according to the UK Tea and Infusions Association. In the US, tea can be found in 80% of American pantries but only 23% of Americans drink tea daily. Per capita consumption is around 8.26 gallons. Coffee in the US recently achieved a modern high point as 66% of Americans now drink coffee daily, more than any other beverage, including tap water, and up by 14% since January, 2021, the largest increase since the National Coffee Association began tracking data in 1950. You see in this uh, document, the uh, relative concentration of tea countries versus coffee countries, the, the uh, uh, volume difference, uh, it's not double, but it's significantly higher for uh, tea. And you also see uh, the distribution of uh, tea in uh, Asia, which uh, is reinforced uh, by this, uh, image of global tea production. Um, production grew by about 61% uh, between 2000 and 2014, and three quarters of that growth is in China. Uh, so you can see China is the dominant producing country in the world. Uh, Kenya is significant, India is definitely about 20%, but uh, China is not only uh, dominant, but growing. The pandemic, however, delivered a sharp blow as tea production fell in 2020 for the first time in decades. Weather conditions were mixed uh, during the first two years and tea estates in many, many major producing countries, including India, were closed because of coronavirus restrictions. Performance in 2021 was generally much stronger, growing to an estimated 2.7%, but expect weaker growth in global tea production overall this year around 2.3%. Tea has grown commercially in 48 countries, but half of the increase in 2022 is likely due to higher tea output in India. The Economist Intelligence Unit predicts that, quote, tea output growth will be firm in both the world's largest and second largest producing countries, China and India, but this will be partially offset by a sharp fall in output in the world's third and fifth largest tea producers, which is Kenya and Sri Lanka. So here's the big picture uh, of the markets. It's important to recognize that, uh, for example, the, uh, the European Union is only about, drinks only about 5% of the world's tea. Uh, CIS drinks about 2.3% uh, of the world's tea. The United States drinks about 2.3%. And note that the United States has twice the population of the CIS. So uh, these are relatively small uh, contributors. Uh, China drinks about 40% of the tea. India drinks about 21% of the tea. And you can see in the green block uh, that uh, mo most of the uh, tea uh, countries uh, are concentrated in uh, uh, that are concentrated in Europe are uh, in the southern uh, portion. Most of the northern countries, uh, like uh, Sweden and uh, uh, Finland and Norway, 
uh, our coffee drinkers. The global tea market is going to generate about $207 billion in 2022, rising to about $267 billion by 2025. China uh, drinks about $100 million, spends about $100 billion on tea, $43 billion of that uh, on wholesale. And Europe accounts for about $20 billion in sales, <clears throat> spending about $24 per person uh, per year. Herbal teas generate about $3 billion, uh, but in emerging markets, black and green tea dominate. So as we look to the future and where the growth is going to occur, uh, presuming that much of the growth is going to occur uh, in brands that are uh, regional in nature and, uh, or national, um, we see uh, that the Russian Federation, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, uh, you see this band of uh, countries is uh, uh, already drinking a lot of tea and the middle class is expanding and they're generating more revenue and they're, uh, they're, uh, they have a preference for a packaged tea now instead of loose tea at the market and they're drinking far more tea and tea bags. The retail value of black tea bags is expected to grow globally by about 525 million by 2025, even with sharp declines in developed countries where retail sales uh, fell by 27 million annually between 2015 and 2020, according to Euromonitor. I find it interesting that green tea production in China was flat last year at 0.36%, an increase of only 6,700 metric tons to total, uh, total 1.85 uh, million metric tons, that's uh, uh, billions of kilos. Black tea continued its growth spurt to 435,000 metric tons, increasing by 7.5% compared to 2020. Globally, black tea consumption has risen by an average of 26% uh, per year since 2008. Consumption is growing fastest in producing countries. I think it's fascinating that the amount of tea consumed in China, India, and Turkey is greater than all the tea consumed in all the other world's nations combined. So there's a big demand for black tea. And the question is, uh, will it be a uh, uh, tea bag tea or, or uh, orthodox tea, leaf tea, or some mixture of the two? My, my thought is this is that uh, CTC is not going anywhere. It's a, a fine type of tea. It can be improved in terms of quality and it's really essential for uh, a lot of products like chai, for example. But um, what, will, what will happen is, is that there's gonna be a big demand for whole leaf and what's called BPS or uh, broken pico sushong orthodox tea. Uh, Narendra uh, Dharmaraj though, pointed out something to me that I thought was very interesting. He said that tea consumers want their tea to look leafy as in orthodox, but with the liquor strength of CTC, which is apparently uh, contra because it's uh, whole and broken leaf teas infuse more slowly than CTC, which quickly colors the cup. If you drink tea to be healthy, it takes, you know, 150 seconds to extract half of the polyphenols from the green or black tea leaves. There's little additional benefit after five minutes. If you drink tea for the caffeine boost, you get 17 milligrams the first minute, 38 milligrams after three minutes, to a maximum of 47 milligrams after five minutes. Lipton yellow label uh, was used to do the above uh, test. Uh, so if you want to enjoy the aromatics and delicate flavors of tea, you should really steep it for one to three minutes. In my view, stacking steeps by sequentially adjusting steep time produces the ideal combination of flavor, caffeine, and beneficial oxidants. I've been using a prototype of the new brew tea maker that automates the process, programming the machine to extract aromatics at lower temperatures for a minute, followed by a longer main steep, and then finishing with a hot wash to ensure 
that I get uh, the healthful polyphenols without the harsh tea flavor, without the harsh uh, bitterness of uh, tannins. So how do you define uh, authentic tea? I turn to Shannon Ting, who's the founder of uh, Tea Drunk in New York. Uh, she says that just as processing grapes does not give you wine, drying leaves does not give you tea. Once we discovered that we could yield so many nuances in the flavor of tea, we learned how to harness tea's potential. And by manipulating heat and moisture, we created the sophisticated beverage that we know today. Here's an example of those three uh, pillars, she calls them, uh, on which authentic tea rests. Uh, first is terrar, the soil plus the climate, then the varietal, the plant plus the provenance, and third is the crafting uh, and processing. Here's an example of uh, one of the regional teas out of Azerbaijan that uh, meets that criteria. And a different brand out of uh, Turkey, uh, also a regional brand worth watching. Uh, Turkey uh, exported about 17 million worth of tea in 2021, which isn't very large, but exports are up 43%. And uh, it's becoming very popular in, in Europe. And here's that Lamont Yoto that I mentioned, uh, distributed 100 metric tons uh, to five uh, North African countries. It's uh, based in, uh, in Morocco. So I feel that clean tea as an expression of the tea maker's skills will experience unprecedented recognition and profits. Awareness and respect for culture are intuitive for brands well-grounded at origin. Multinationals led the way by marketing tea as energizing and helpful, citing meaningful research that overwhelmingly attests to the science-based benefits. Large ventures have since championed sustainable tea production, regenerative agriculture, and finance the growth of third-party certification. The multinationals have contributed enormously to the tea industry and, and will continue to thrive. But the pandemic reminded tea drinkers of its calming, stress-reducing benefits and how tea enhances mindfulness and clarity and how enjoying a cup at home is a pleasure that few will, uh, that more will embrace. So I'm ready for questions. So one of the things that's on everybody's mind is uh, the differentiator in the tea markets between the differentiation in the tea markets between orthodox and uh, processed teas. Hi, Dan. Hey, everyone. Hi. Sorry, is, is, <laughs> is that the end of your presentation? I just wasn't sure. Yeah, it is, uh, although I'm going to take questions, of course. Oh, fantastic. First of all, thank you so much for that fascinating insight. Um, always, always wonderful to listen to your uh, theories and backed up with stats as well. Um, also, happy belated birthday. We didn't know it was your birthday uh, weekend, so I hope you had a good one. Um, <laughs> uh, the thing is, you know, every culture drinks tea, isn't it? but just yes. different types. And if you know the type of tea a culture drinks, you're more likely to make better connections with them. And that is the wonderful, really the wonderful thing about tea. It can teach you so much about history, arts, and culture. Um, before everyone has questions, because I think I'm sure, uh, please everybody, if you do have questions, uh, don't feel uh, shy to put it in the Q&A box uh, uh, below and we'll be happy to address that with Dan. Uh, but, you know, as Esther, we see so many uh, new tea companies wanting to join and wanting some direction uh, on how best they can, uh, you know, start a company that would be successful. And with this information, what advice do you have uh, for the curation or concept? You know, and can you can you give them some advice uh, based yeah, on this knowledge? 
Yeah, that, uh, there, there is two theories that are both, uh, both have merit. One is, uh, let's make the tea for the customer. Let's make the tea for the market. Let's ask the market what they want, and then we'll make tea for them. So <clears throat> the folks down in Australia are making nitrogenated tea in tin cans, which are sold at bars and are a wonderful innovation. It's a low alcohol alternative to drinking beer, but it has a foamy head. And uh, it's the kind of thing uh, that's going to be successful because there's a drinking occasion that calls for a non-alcoholic beverage that's nicely suited to tea. And, uh, you know, now you've got a manufacturer down there who's producing the tea and it's catching on. So do you build the tea for that, you know, slice of the market, that drinking occasion? Or uh, do you do what's uh, what I've just been talking about today, like, for example, or Remy or uh, Azerbaijani? Uh, tea. What they're doing is, is they're saying, we're going to be true to our roots. We're going to use the cultivars, uh, you know, that uh, work well uh, w with our, uh, you know, terrain, our terrain. We're going to use the skills of the local tea makers to, you know, bring out those characteristics. Uh, the best example two weeks ago was uh, a Samadori. It's a Samadori Sencha out of uh, Japan that sold for a uh, almost 2 million yen at the first auction at the Shizuoka auction. And uh, Samadori is a, a kind of a new, interesting, sweet, not grassy tasting cultivar. Uh, the sencha was so beautiful. You, the needles were so tight, you could so address with them. And uh, the tea itself was uh, beautifully made. So it was an example of what I've been talking about. The craft was evident, the new, uh, sweeter, more popular with younger people, uh, cultivar was evident, the styling and crafting according to the old rules, you know, the hand uh, hand rolling and the beauty of the, of the tea. And, and, it, and it went for, uh, you know, 15,500, $15,466 a kilo. Uh, so clearly somebody got rewarded for that. So um, that's the other thing to do is to just be who you are, what you are, be true to your uh, uh, Kazakhstan or, uh, you know, Afghanistan or Pakistan or Indian or Sri Lankan uh, regional uh, preferences, and then recognize that the, the marketing and distribution have made it possible for you to be who you are, be proud of what you are and what you do, and then market that uh, to people all over the world who are looking for a different experience or looking for teas that are uh, different uh, than, uh, you know, what they find on the local shelf. What I don't think is going to work real well is a cookie cutter is saying to the world, well, this is a tree that you, you know, this is the tea that you'll drink. And, and you know, Lipton recognizes that. Th there isn't a Lipton yellow tea. There's 17 different blends of Lipton that are used in different cultures, different uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, they're designed with different blending components uh, and, you know, they're tailored to the market because they want to make sure that the tea is the tea that arrives in the market has to taste good, regardless of whether it's an authentic tea or it's an innovative new tea. So uh, the advice you give to folks, I think that's sound is to, first of all, really find a differentiating characteristic of your tea. Don't just duplicate with what everybody else does. If you're not going to be innovative and do something new and interesting, it's not going to work because you're not going to have authenticity going for you. You're not going to have a good brand story. You're not going to have uh, the benefit from marketing, uh, you know, social media marketing where people talk about your brand and amplify your, your marketing dollars. So uh, be true to yourself, you know, find out what you feel is really an authentic expression of your creativity as a, as a tea maker and then make decisions about how you're going to market it and, and how you're going to distribute it after that. Well said. Thank you very much. Authenticity is key to produce good quality um, for your customers. Uh, just before I move on to a question, Virginia Lovelace has actually asked, what is the name of that uh, Japanese green tea that you mentioned? Yeah, it's, uh, it's called uh, Say S A. E M I D O R I, same Midori. And you can read uh, my articles about it on T Biz uh, podcast. I also wrote for Stir Magazine. There's an article in Stir Magazine 
And, uh, you know, the podcast last week featured the uh, TVS podcast. I'll, I'll give a plug here for my stuff. Please subscribe to my stuff. It's free. And there's a lot of interesting things there. And you'll be joining 25,000 other people who, uh, you know, listen and uh, uh, visit the blog uh, every month. So it's really great to, to see my audience and, and kind of express myself visually. But at the same time, uh, lots of this data is, uh, you know, rich data, of many, many articles in the magazine and in the, in the blog. Fantastic. Plug away. That's no problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a question from uh, Alexis. Um, she says, by the way, great presentation, really interesting. Uh, it's really strange that the wealthiest countries choose coffee as their preferred beverage rather than tea. Now, have you any idea why or any yeah. suggestions as to how we can reverse this? Yeah, there's two things. Uh, geography plays a big part. You'll notice that the coffee drinking countries with legs, let's say the exception of Brazil, uh, are northern uh, countries. Uh, coffee is uh, consumed at a higher temperature and it's, you know, higher caffeine. Uh, it, so you have, you know, the Norway, uh, Denmark, uh, you know, Sweden, Finland reality, uh, as well as the U.S. and Canada. So... Having said that, I think it's important to note, like in England, for example, there's a lot of conversation about how England is a coffee country. Well, uh, uh, England drinks 70 million uh, cups of coffee a day. That's great, but it drinks 100 million uh, cups of tea. So I don't know. If it's, I don't know if it's a, a coffee country yet. I think what happens is, is you look at the demographics. So, so for example, younger people. 87% of millennials drink tea, but they also drink coffee. So uh, what, what you see instead is an interest in specialty hot beverages, which are often herbals, uh, green teas, uh, traditional black teas, a sizable amount of uh, crossover teas, things like uh, bubble tea and uh, chai. And then you also see a strong interest in, uh, you know, uh, Mate is catching on. There's, there's just a, there's a good argument that instead of a, a coffee shop or a tea shop, uh, that you want to be a, a specialty beverage shop uh, that uh, you know offers hot beverages or one that offers cold beverages, and uh, I think that uh, that may be a very uh, good advice for retailers. Thank you very much. Okay, so the questions are coming in swift and fast. Um, <laughs> um, next one for you. So sorry, it's, it's kind of a machine gun um, approach. Nigel Milligan, she says, thank you, Dan, a masterly discourse and much food for thought. You passed over the instant tea and RTD segments. These mainly use industrial tea extracts, virtually devoid of style or quality. Now with a rapid expanding world population demanding ever more tea, where do you see these industrial teas going up? Up market or ever downwards? You know, I see uh, it dividing in the same way that uh, the, t the tea market, the dry tea market's dividing, uh, Nigel. You're going to have, uh, I mean, China, for example, is the largest RTD market in the world. No question that they're going to shift and drink a lot of iced tea. And, uh, you know, they're going to drink tea more of the Edoine uh, quality, uh, high uh, quality tea, premium quality tea. Edoine a couple of years ago actually uh, produced a first flush limited edition bottled green sentia, which captured that amazing first uh, moment of, uh, you know, the tea season uh, beautifully uh, for just a limited amount of time. And then they, uh, you know, charged a premium price for it. And that was it. It was gone. And, you know, what was neat about that is, is that that season was that season. So, uh, that particular tea isn't really reproducible because the next year there'd be more rain or less rain or more sun or less sun. So uh, a short answer is, is and, I, and I made a note of that at the very top of the presentation, uh, RTD I could talk about for another hour and uh, uh, the prognosis will be this, uh, RTD is going to outsell because of its convenience uh, dry tea for a long time to come. And a lot of the world is going to follow the U.S. lead, uh, including Canada, uh, and learn to drink uh, bottled teas. Now, in our favor, and I'm a, a tea drinker, 
is a rule like we saw the Indians uh, pass here uh, this last week in which they said that no more than 5% of the tea could be uh, flavoring. And uh, what they were saying there was is that if you're gonna market this stuff as an herbal, uh, you know, echinacea or whatever, then nobody cares. If you're gonna start calling it tea, then you can't make it, uh, you know, it's not tea if it's made uh, with mostly other stuff. Uh, so um, I think that uh, RTD is here to stay. It's a bigger market, it's a faster growing market. In many ways, I feel like it's uh, more innovative. I love cold brewed, cold tea, you know, chilled. Mm -hmm. And I make uh, what's called uh, uh, f flash brewed iced tea in the kitchen all the time because there's a moment when you first drink that tea where it's poured over ice, where it's just so thirst quenching and so good that it just beats hot tea that day, especially, you know, when it's 40 degrees C. It was 143 degrees Fahrenheit in India two weeks ago. 143? <laughs> That's pretty hot. So I think the you know, as climate change affects the world, there's going to be a greater interest in uh, quenching thirst than there's going to be in, uh, in heating. Uh, although, it's absolutely true that drinking hot tea cools you during the summer because it makes you perspire. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Knut has a, a question for you. Um, if demand for artisanal tea will grow and take a larger part of the tea market, does that mean that we should expect the price for tea globally to, to go up since the CTC drinkers will start drinking more orthodox tea, which is more costly to produce? That's right. The conversation Will Battle had with you a few weeks ago is really instructive. It's hard right now for the people who are making higher quality teas to get all the certifications and, you know, with the higher cost of production, uh, make a profit. But uh, the differentiator here in the, uh, in the market is, is uh, how much of uh, the tea dollar uh, goes to, uh, you know, the farm. So uh, Joy Deep Pecan the other day published a little study that showed that one to three percent of the uh, retail price goes to the farmer, fifty-three percent of the retail price goes to the retailer, and thirty-three percent of the retail price uh, goes to the uh, you know blender and and uh, the distribution side there. So uh, eighty-six percent versus three percent. Uh, says that the end of the supply chain is really benefiting and, and uh, not the front of the supply chain. And I think that uh, uh, as you make an argument that something's premium, I think you could tie that through transparency to origin and make the point that if the farm gate, isn't, the farm gate price isn't coming up, uh, then it's not really a premium tea. It's an exploit, you know, it's a tea that's exploiting uh, the work uh, of of people and it needs to move in the other direction. Thanks, Dan. Okay, um, Stefan uh, has asked a question. In most tea drinking countries, tea is a lifestyle, but in North America, tea is a lifestyle brand that seems to have connections to individual desires of health, uh, fitness, relaxation, etc. This seems focused on specialty teas that individuals choose for their specific benefits that can change day-to-day -day based on desire. Do you agree with this? And if so, how do you see the market developing based on these ideas? You know, what happens in the developed countries is we have a very highly competitive beverage market. We've got not hundreds of brands, but thousands of brands. And we don't have a dozen categories of uh, drink. We've got you know, 17 different kinds of juice and 20 different kinds of coffee and 25, 30 different kinds of tea. So <clears throat> when you're in a highly competitive market and the products are similar, it's all about marketing. So uh, what, what's happening is, is a lot of these companies invest a huge amount of money, especially online companies. <clears throat> they just invest a huge amount of money in telling you why you should buy their tea. I think the money's better spent by explaining why their tea is distinctive and uh, what the tea brand story is. But in either event, uh, in the developed markets, uh, because of highly competitive nature, you have to create 
uh, you know, excitement and enthusiasm. And uh, boy, the pandemic sure spurred that along because an enormous number of people uh, felt better drinking tea during the pandemic and uh, really came to appreciate it as a, you know, an at-home beverage. And I think that will stay with us, but they're not going to exclusively switch to tea. They're going to continue to drink coffee first thing in the morning, and they'll might even experiment with uh, yerba mate. They'll definitely have uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, iced teas and, and bottled teas uh, throughout the day. Yes, indeed, because after all, everyone's addicted to a certain habit, isn't it? So you're not going to shift away from it just like that. Right. Okay, next question from Dr. Sazie. Um, it was a very useful presentation for me. Thank you so much. You are someone who follows the world of tea industry very closely. How would you evaluate the change in consumer preferences around the world based on your experience? For example, 50 years from now, how will the tea products in the market change? Thank you. The most significant thing that's driving uh, change there is consumer behavior. And uh, consumer behavior is closely related to how much money they make in their home, you know, I mean, in their, in, uh, how much their household income is. So what will happen is, is, is that uh, people who taste good tea consistently want to taste more good tea. They don't go down the ladder, they go up the ladder. If they start with a commodity, low, low quality, you know, uh, RTD extract, and they learn to drink uh, tea bags and pyramids, and they learn to then, you know, make broken leaf and whole leaf teas. They uh, just continuously move up. So what happens over the next 50 years is the expansion of the middle class significantly increases the demand for packaged tea, and the competition for packaged tea significantly increases the incentives for people who make packaged tea to improve the packaged tea and to innovate. And what we see is, is a healthy spiral there because now more people get the message, um, you know, that tea's healthful. That, uh, that's what I meant a minute ago when I said that uh, 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 it's remarkable um, how uh, clear the message was received in countries uh, like rural India and rural Bangladesh and, uh, you know, rural Egypt uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, the, the people who hear about a pandemic immediately want to do something to benefit themselves and to use a very approachable, easy thing that really works. Uh, it does boost your immunization. Uh, it does help you, uh, calms you down, if nothing else. So uh, short answer over the next 50 years, it's a bright future. But, you know, countervailing uh, climate change is going to significantly impact the amount of quality, uh, the amount of tea, but even more important, the quality of tea. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the problem that we have to solve here is how to convert the industry to uh, tea entrepreneurs, farmer entrepreneurs who have a financial benefit from making the tea better are going to drive up uh, the quality and they're going to lead to, you know, more uh, wealth uh, in the in the tea lands. And that in itself uh, creates uh you know, research centers, investment in uh, research and development, larger companies. You know, one of the things I don't want to make, uh, I don't want you to think of these national and uh, regional companies, the uh, tea companies, as insignificant players. <laughs> They're very significant players. They're multi-billion dollar companies. It's just that they've looked at their market. And although they want to expand it, like Kikur and, and uh, you know, Azerbaijan, what they're doing is, is they're being very strategic about that uh, because they, for example, know that they're not going to have a huge market in Japan. So they don't waste a lot of dollars marketing uh, to the Japanese. They waste uh, very few dollars uh, marketing to the rest of the globe because they know uh, their sweet spot is uh, Russia, for example, or Moldova or, you know, uh, you know, Belarus. And when they see that and invest in that market to get a return. And, uh, you know, what I'm excited about is what will happen in Africa as those brands, like uh, that little one uh, 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 in Morocco, what happens is those brands get to be billion dollar brands and really develop interesting new ways of, you know, sort of uh, promoting the tea culture from places like Morocco. Indeed. Thank you. I've realized also that we've uh, just uh, um, 
uh, five were well, five minutes over time, but we've had <laughs> a lot of no. Don't worry because we have a lot of still wonderful questions coming. So stick with us, guys. Um, I, I you know I'm sure it wouldn't take too long, but uh, yes, you you want to stick around for this. Um, so I have a question uh, from Nancy from Kenya. And she says, I actually wonder, do we have brands that write the specific tea origins on the packet? I think more I've seen um, in the market more and more tea brands do that to actually inspire the consumer to be interested in provenance. Would you agree? Yes, I think that's absolutely true. And I think that uh, you use symbolism. So, for example, uh, you use the cup that the tea is served in. You uh, put in the background the samovar in which it was made. You use the colors at the table. You use the bowl versus the cup. And, uh, you know, what you're saying is, is we're authentic. It's, it's not authentic to drink. Uh, if you're in, if you're in uh, Kazakhstan, it's not authentic to drink tea out of a little Chinese cup. That's not what they do. So uh, if you're going to market your tea there, market with the idea that it's going to be in a bowl and the bowl's going to look a certain diameter and, you know, there's going to be a family of tea drinkers that, uh, you know, uh, not, not gimmicky costumes, but uh, people who are consuming tea in a normal way. Uh, one of the things I did very carefully over the last six months is select those first 12 slides because what I was trying to do was actually show the tea and the teaware in which it was served. And I wanted to give you a glimpse, like, for example, the street corner scene in Turkey of all of those people sitting on the street drinking tea and, uh, you know, having uh, snacks. That's uh, Turkey so vibrant. Uh, it's, it teas everywhere. You can't walk 50 feet without running into tea. Fantastic. Okay, very interesting. We have a producer here called Noah, and um, he says, so as a new tea producer who, know, who now knows that regional teas are where one should focus, where should I sell my first teas to get my start? I am intent on producing high-grade handmade teas to the tea, and tea enthusiast market. Should I be focusing locally or sell it internationally? I think this is a great question. Yeah, I love the question. And my advice has been consistent for decades on this. Find your local market, refine your packaging, learn your messaging, do sampling so that you can actually hear people say to you, you know, I like this flavor note, or I like this particular color, or I think this attribute of your tea, you know, this element of aroma is very appealing to me. Because when you hear enough people repeat that, it allows you to think, okay, that's a marketable characteristic of my tea that the consumer finds pleasing, I'm going to then, you know, suggest that on the, in the labeling and the, uh, uh, in the color choices I use in the setting. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the nitrogen tea in a tin can. You don't want that in some oriental setting of, uh, you know, that's not the matcha tea ceremony with a beer can. It's a bar. And, uh, you know, they're popping the top off of that tea and pouring it into a beer glass, not into a tea glass. And that would then signal where that tea is uh, going to be successful. So my advice then is to find out what are the icons and the colors and the signals uh, that, uh, you know, best represent your vision of the tea made authentic by, you know, agreement with the tea maker. In other words, the tea maker's final product has to be consistent with that messaging and then uh, go ahead and expand internationally. Uh, you can offer your tea locally and make enough money to branch out regionally. And then once you've made the regional, you, you, once you've made a regional, you've got a business that's sizable. You can then make a choice as to whether you want to go international or simply be good in the region. Or Remy Trade and May are both big food companies, and they they distribute all of their food along with their teas in places like Russia and, and Belarus. So they, they're not really interested in establishing supermarkets in the United States or in Britain or something. Fantastic advice. And Noah, we wish you the best of luck, and we can't wait to taste uh, what you're making. So, um, okay, with that, uh, this is a question from Benedict. Um, what's your favorite tea and why? What's that? 
what's your favorite tea and why? Oh, <laughs> I'm a seasonal tea drinker. So, for example, I have Anji by Cha right now on my table because that's a new tea, the early spring tea that came out of China. I just delight in it. I'm drinking Sencha uh, from uh, Japan for much the same reason. And uh, <clears throat> I'm curious about that same Midori. I've never tasted a sweet uh, as opposed to grassy uh, Japanese Sencha. So I wrote ahead and got some. Uh, standards for me are Kimam. I, I drink more black tea than green tea. And uh, I drink uh, single origin, uh, single single estate teas out of the Neil Grease out of uh, Assam and uh, Darjeeling. I also drink uh, Li Shans out of uh, Taiwan. I have a rock tea, you know, marathon that I go through every winter. Uh, for some reason, I just immediately have to have rock tea. And then uh, once I have the rock tea oolongs, I suddenly uh, have a taste for puer. So, uh, you know, in the fall and winter, I drink a lot more puer because it's cold up here. It's 35, 45 degrees below zero Celsius. We had a oh. blizzard on Easter <laughs> this year. Oh, we had, you know, goodness. inches of snow on Easter. So, uh, you know what? You, you you drink more formidable, substantive and, uh, you know, uh, enhanced teas like uh, I'll throw sugar and cream in with them. Much more likely in the winter than I would in the spring or summer. Thank you so much. Okay, I have, uh, well, three more questions. Um, do you, one of them quite long, actually, it's a, I'm going to read to you from Mackenzie. Um, but do you think you could, uh, uh, what you call that, you know, give as short answer as possible? Um, I'll be happy only because to do that. We, we have, we're running out of time, but uh, Mackenzie says, hi, Dan, great insight. I love the depth of knowledge you have and share. You've delivered a lot of value to the audience. Now, I agree with your insight premise that culturally relevant tea brands are positioned to thrive in the market. I have two questions. Um, if you were to build a successful regional tea brand, how would you do it? And if you own a successful regional tea brand, how would you approach expanding a brand beyond your local region? Yeah, well, you know what I would do is I would buy uh, a local brand that had a history and a good story. Uh, I'd go to the go to the tea makers and the folks and say, look, you know, the thing I can do for you is to build your market and create a greater wealth for you. And uh, the thing you do is uh, lend authenticity and, uh, you know, deep seated understanding of of uh, you know the tea and the tea plants and what it takes. Once uh, once you establish a regional brand, um, you can see how either ethnicity uh, you know connects the whole world. And uh, for example, uh, if you have a great Semidori Sencha, how you would market it to Japanese markets all over the world and put it on the tea shelf there because there'd be like six inches, this would be a differentiated sencha, probably do very well. Uh, even though you're a regional brand, you'd still have uh, significant distribution outside, uh, you know, your native market. If I happen to be that same Midori in uh, Japan, uh, what I would say is, is that within my region, which is northern Shizuoka, uh, more and more of that cultivar is being planted. And it's a delicate cultivar. It's, it has problems with uh, cold. Interestingly enough, this year was a cold year in Japan and uh, it never crossed the threshold of destroying the same Midori. It just made it grow slower and made it tastier. So that kind of thing is what you say uh, to, you know, the market. Uh, that, that uh, is in your immediate region, and you'll sell a lot of t a lot of tea that way because there are already sensu drinkers. So you're explaining to them why this particular sensu just rocks. Thank you so much, uh, Mackenzie. That was a really really good question, um, and thank you for your answer, Dan. Okay, so from Alexander, the question was: um, There are current tea options, but they have limits on who can trade. If local producers, such as in Laos, want to make the, an auction, their auction, what is the best way for it? Well, first you have to make the decision whether or not you're going to produce containers full of tea. 
right? Because auctions favor bulk, <coughs> uh, bulk sales. So if you've got thousands of hectares or at least hundreds of hectares and you're producing millions or you know hundreds of thousands of kilos of tea, then auctions are a useful way for you to uh, you know sell your tea. It's an efficient way of selling your tea. But I think that most regionals are going to choose to use uh, uh, local markets uh, first, and then hyper markets because they went ahead and invested in packaging and you know put it on the supermarket shelf for at home consumption. They're going to have a relationship with food service so that the tea is popularized on menus and you know is available uh, for takeout and delivery uh, you know within their market. That's where bubble tea has excelled amazingly around the world. And then I think that uh, the branding, as we discussed earlier, uh, if it's authentic and if it's effective, is then going to multiply the effect of, uh, you know, uh, is going to multiply sales and give you the leverage you need, the resources you need to, uh, you know, to broaden. Indeed. Okay, last question of the evening is from Wouter. And he says, what influence do you see on tea trade from the situation in Ukraine? And what do you expect in the future from it? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that, Water. I appreciate it. Here's a, a kiss to Water, my friend. <laughs> uh, well, what's happening there is, is that uh, there's a double catastrophe. Uh, Sri Lanka has for, uh, for a long time uh, been the primary supplier of Orthodox tea to the world about 280 million uh, kilos and Sri Lanka made some bad decisions in the last couple of years and they made a terrible they're in an economic terrible economic crisis so they can no longer uh, supply uh, the tea that they normally would and then doubling that compound is the fact that about 4 million kilos of their tea and uh, went to Ukraine and about 30 million went to Russia there, uh, you can't get the tea to Russia uh, because of the pricing problems, uh, uh, payment, sta uh, payment stabilization, and you know uh, uh, settlements. So uh, what happened is, is that uh, India, which only produces about 120, used to be the biggest supplier to Russia and was for many years, for decades, uh, to the Soviet Union. So this is like a huge opportunity for India. However much uh, tea they convert to, um, you know, orthodox, they're going to benefit from. So we've already seen uh, it's it's 159 rupees a kilo in Middle Greece. Uh, the Russians are bidding for it in large quantities, and you're going to see a physical shift away from uh, ordering from uh, Sri Lanka, which is. You know, it's having bad weather. It's not able to make shipments. It, it doesn't. It's worried about sanctions. You're going to see a massive shift to some other country that can produce, uh, you know, Orthodox tea. And the most uh, likely beneficiary is India because they worked a ruble uh, for a rupees deal uh, that bypasses sanctions, so they're not worried about getting paid anymore. And I was talking to some Russians this morning who were saying that they're actually decreasing the price of their tea in the market now because for the first time they can see some clarity instead of, uh, you know, a, a ever rising, you know, inflation driven ceiling. Uh, what they're instead doing is saying, hey, let's keep it level and keep it inexpensive because we know that people in Russia are going to have less money. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that if they have less money, that uh, we have teas that meet their their needs. Well, the Russians won't compromise. They don't want to drink bad tasting tea. So whatever the compromise is will be leafy BP probably. And uh, it's going to come out of India. And because the Indians have chosen to, uh, you know, kind of ignore the sanctions, uh, what you're going to see is just that the Indians actually get paid and everything works for them. A big question in my mind is how much Kenya wants to do with that? Because a lot of growers in Kenya can produce leafy tea, and they have very reasonable prices. Uh, so well, my guess is, is that uh, that will happen. What surprised me is, is that leafy tea producers in Azerbaijan, uh, for example, don't see Russia as a very helpful market because they get much better rates locally. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's very and interesting. So, so uh, that's a perfect example of why an authentic tea is sustainable and powerful, because even though you can make money exporting it, it's just like the Chinese. The Chinese never export. Uh, they export 7% of their tea. They drink 93%. The, um, the, the Chinese never export their most expensive teas because it's all purchased by people in, you know, whatever, Japan or China, Taiwan, who know the tea and have actually bought it with the idea that it's, you know, something they buy every year. The, the Longjing people, for example, will will buy and have bought the same lot of tea, irrespective of price, for 20, 30, and 40 years. Uh, you know, companies will buy that tea and pay thousands of dollars for it because they use it for gifting, they use it for entertaining uh, business associates. It's just amazing. So a short answer is, is Ukraine is really, this invasion of Ukraine has really upended the whole, whole you know, stable CTC versus orthodox of uh, ratio. And uh, that's good for us because uh, the BPs and the holes are better tasting tea. So there's going to be more of them made. There's a greater incentive to make more of them. And even though the Russians won't pay top price for them, because of the situation, they're going to pay whatever the Indians want to charge them for it because uh, Russia is simply not going to be able to get tea from the West. It's the guys in the West, Germany, for example, just are, are not going to send any tea to any tea to Russia. So England, Germany, all of these guys who populated that uh, the shelf I showed you during the slide presentation are are uh, have already withdrawn or, or are even ceasing to do business with Russia because of the war. And, you know, it's not like people are going to quit drinking tea in Russia. It's just they're going to drink less expensive tea probably because of the stress and everything, they're going to drink more of it. And <clears throat> with the closing of places like, you know, McDonald's and stuff, it means a lot more of their tea is going to be, you know, consumed at home. Very well said. Thank you very, very much for your insights. And I wish we could uh, have more time with you as always, Dan. <laughs> Um, but that's all the time we have today. But thank you so much uh, for, you know, for, for everything. And also thank you everyone for taking the time out of your day to join us and to stay um, this long with us as well. Now, next up, we'll be zooming in on Darjeeling. And if you are a fan, you don't want to miss this. We have uh, Raja Banerjee. Uh, he is an entrepreneur and environmental activist and we he, he will take us actually on an imaginary voyage to Darjeeling, telling us romantic tales about its landscape, its natural beauty, and why Darjeeling is known as the champagne of teas. That's also going to be interesting. Now, the European Specialty Tea Association exists to raise standards everywhere, and we do this by embracing innovation, we share knowledge like this, and encourage collaborations. Our aim is to improve every cup of tea that is served and make sure our producers, like Noah, get a fair price for their efforts to make better tea. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization and consists of wonderful volunteers from all over the world to help us bring great content, education programs, and events. And to do this, we rely heavily on membership to survive and would appreciate your support. We have different packages to suit individuals and businesses. So for more information, do visit us in specialtyteaeurope.com. But for now, everybody, I wanted to say, take care. Let's spread happiness with love of 40. Goodbye for now. Take care. Thank you so much, Dan, and have a wonderful evening, morning, or afternoon, everybody. Take care now. Farewell, Bye. everyone. Farewell.